understand the changing world, it is important to understand the man who's triggering many of these changes. Xi Jinping, the leader of China, has been in charge for more than seven years now. And Xi Jinping's China is not Mao's China. This is not Deng's China. This is an aggressive beast. Xi's Chinese dream is the resurrection of Mao's totalitarianism with the technological tools that Mao could only dream of. How do you deal with Xi Jinping's China? That's what we'll discuss in this session. Joining us from Pune, Ambassador Gautam Babavle. He was India's ambassador to China during the Modi Xi Wuhan summit. He also led the diplomatic initiative to defuse the 2013 Depsang standoff in Ladakh. From London, we have Bruno Masai, senior fellow at Hudson Institute and senior advisor at Flint Global. He served as Europe Minister for Portugal from 2013 to 2015. He's the author of Belt and Road, A Chinese World Order. And from California, Derek Grossman, senior defense analyst at RAND Corporation. He tracks China's foreign and security policy. He's an expert on Indo-Pacific security affairs. Yep. Ambassador Bambavle, I want to begin with you. What explains Xi Jinping's actions and his aggression, especially at a time when, when there's a pandemic that the world is dealing with, and most in the world believe that the pandemic was his fault? That's an excellent question, Palki. And uh, to answer that, I think I have to go back to 2012-13 when Xi Jinping first came in as General Secretary of the Communist Party of China. He started very aggressively within China, domestically, by um, trying to put many of his opponents out of business. Some of them were put into jail, and some of them even uh, lost their lives. And I think this particular streak of aggressiveness is now being seen internationally. You can see it in Hong Kong, where a new national security law has been passed very quickly. Uh, you can see it in the South China Sea, where uh, China has been aggressive for several years now. And you can even see it now on the India-China border. So I think this is something to do with his approach, his mental makeup. Uh, the COVID-19 situation seems to be a, a time when uh, China feels that it can uh, strike out and hit out at others uh, while they are dealing with the COVID-19 situation, that is the other countries. And I think as far as India is concerned, we are particularly concerned that the India-China border has uh, become a live border uh, while India is still tackling the COVID-19 disease. Bruno Masai, China is being blamed for this pandemic. Is Xi Jinping hoping to brazen it out? Is this a case of offense being the best form of defense? Or, or is he buying his own propaganda and does he truly believe that he can conquer all? I think, I think it's a bit of both. Um, Chinese authorities and Xi Jinping in particular probably think they're going to pay a reputation price. They're going to pay a, a price in terms of how the world regards China anyway. So you might as well take advantage of the opportunity to make some moves that otherwise you, you would be cautious about. I think Hong Kong is an example of that. Uh, the India question, I think, has its, its own dynamics. At the same time, um, I don't think it's all about Xi Jinping. Uh, I think it's about the trajectory of China over the past few decades. Uh, 10, 20, 20, 25 years ago, China was uh, focused on growing economically um, and was aware of its weaknesses. Um, and China now is, is obviously a different China. Um, it's already past that threshold where you feel confident that you can create economic growth on your own, that you can create technological development on your own. And so with Xi Jinping or with another leader, I think we would see a much more aggressive, uh, much more uh, ambitious China anyway about this time. Uh, and even Deng uh, uh, talked about this, uh, Deng Xiaoping talked about this on, on some occasions, that in the future there would be another China. Uh, his strategy was not a strategy that would last forever. Since you've mentioned the past, Derek Grossman, it's no secret that Xi Jinping has junked Deng's mantra and he has broken the low-profile doctrine. He's not shy of showing his strength and he doesn't seem to, be, to believe in the idea of biding his time. Uh, but would you say that his world domination plans are ill-timed right now? Well, I, uh, I, I, I would dispute, I guess, the, the premise of the question that China wants world domination. Um, I, I don't think that even Xi Jinping himself believes that he can achieve that, even having uh, done away with term limits uh, and, you know, Xi Jinping for life potentially out until 
at least 2049, the 100th uh, year anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. I mean, that's really a tall order for world domination. But what I do think Xi Jinping is very interested in doing is having, at a minimum, uh, China being the center of uh, the Indo-Pacific, the center of gravity, um, and that means U.S. forces essentially out of the region by 2050, uh, and that would reverse the century of humiliation that China talks about in its propaganda narrative time and again. Um, but, you know, what's also uh, important to point out is that that doesn't mean that China's ambitions are necessarily limited to the region. I think they do want to play a global role on par with the United States out into that 2050 time frame. Right. Uh, the U.S. forces in the region have nothing to do or little to do with India. Gautam Bambavle, two years back you were in Wuhan facilitating a new chapter, if I may, in the Indo-China friendship. Uh, a lot has changed. Now they've come to blows. Did you see this coming? No, I did not see this coming. Uh, but I can very clearly say, Palki, that, uh, you know, that chapter now seems to be closed. China has attempted military coercion on India's borders. I think China has, um, in order to do that, China has lost India strategically. And I'll just make three other points uh, quickly on the same theme. Uh, you know, in the last decade or so, there were three major themes which were being discussed. One was whether there would be a peaceful rise of China. I think the answer is staring us in the face very clearly. No, it will not be a peaceful rise. Two, is China a responsible stakeholder in the global system? I think the answer is very clear to many of us around the world that China is not a responsible stakeholder in the global system. And the third and last theme was that of the China dream. And I think I believe that the China dream is becoming a nightmare for many people and many countries across the globe. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Bruno Masais, you recently wrote that the border clashes with India were a strategy of war psychology. What does that mean? Well, I think China is interested in, in, to some extent in intimidating India. Uh, it sees India as, a, as an obstacle. It sees India as a problem. Um, India, of course, has led the reaction against the Belt and Road, and it now looks like India is going to lead the world's reaction against uh, Chinese technological dominance. Uh, the apps uh, ban is very significant. Uh, my friends in Beijing uh, were much more concerned about that than, than they are about the border uh, skirmishes. Uh, it's significant that uh, the Indian ambassador that was in Wuhan speaks about China like this uh, today in this show. Uh, certainly, the Wuhan spirit uh, seems that. Uh, it wasn't clear a year ago, but so it's important what is happening in India. And Chinese authorities are very aware of this. They don't talk about India all the time, but I think that's deliberate. That's a way not to give India too much importance and not to increase its self-confidence. Uh, but India is certainly regarded as a problem for Chinese foreign policy. Uh, in a way, compared to Russia, China has dealt with Russia very well, has engaged it, has co-opted it. Uh, with India, things have not gone well from, from the start of, of Xi Jinping's uh, term. Um, and it's perhaps a criticism that, that one can, can, can make or one can re regard it as more or less inevitable. You have two giants growing at the same time, uh, both ambitious. Uh, there was, the relationship was always going to be difficult. I don't think India was ever considering a change of heart on BRI. But whatever little chance China had, if any, has been lost now. This was no way to get India on board. Uh, Derek Grossman, what was the strategy behind the Galwan standoff, according to you? And what did Xi Jinping gain, if anything at all, by taking on India? And what did he lose, according to you? Yeah, I, I think the common narrative out there is that the timing of the Galwan incident is um, mostly related to China trying to exploit the coronavirus pandemic for its own geopolitical gain. But the problem with that narrative is that there's simply no evidence available to support it. China has been engaged since, since Xi Jinping came to power in 2013. She, China has been engaged in these salami slicing tactics, whether you know it's against Taiwan or in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea against Japan. Uh, and also against India for many years now. And so the pre-pandemic behavior of China is essentially um, the same as what we're seeing during the pandemic. And so um, I don't think it's related, uh, it may be in part related somehow to the pandemic, but there's no evidence 
to support that it is that China is doing this because of the pandemic. Um, what I have seen in my own research is that a lot of this is related to China's concerns about um, India changing uh, the status quo uh, near the line of actual control. Now, whether you know China is obviously changing the status quo as well, so they're they're certainly. Uh, you know, a culprit uh, in this situation. I'm not trying to pin all the blame on India, but I'm just saying that Beijing's perception is that what India is doing is improving infrastructure there, improving patrols there, and also the Article 370 um, uh, decision in August 2019 by Prime Minister Modi, I think really shook Beijing up quite a bit in terms of how it now assesses India is thinking about territorial claims broadly. Uh, and so, yes, you know, the, ter the, the, territory, the uh, Article 370 decision was, was a nothing burger in India, right? Because, I mean, that was union territory anyway. But for China, China uh, is now concerned about, well, what does that mean for the status of Aksai Chin? And what does that mean for the status in other uh, disputed areas? And so I think we need to at least... Um, understand that China has been thinking about it that way. Uh, there's Dr. Ashley Tellis, uh, who is a very esteemed uh, analyst of, of India, who has said that Chinese interlocutors have been beating down his door recently, talking about cardiographic um, uh, aggression by India. So this is something that we have to at least consider as a possibility for the timing. I have so much to say about what you've said, but I'd let Gautam Bambavle do the talking for the moment. No, I, I think, Palki, what the Chinese have done this summer is uh, something which is not, uh, is not something which happened in the past. We very often talk about the uh, face-offs and the standoffs between the Indian Army and uh, the Chinese Army of 2013 at Depsang of 2014 at Chumar, 2016 uh, at Doklam in Bhutan. But those were standoffs between patrols and smaller formations of the two armies. This time, the Chinese have come in strength. Uh, several divisions of their PLA are in eastern Ladakh and in the, the hinter, uh, you know, the depth areas. Uh, so this is something which has been well thought out. It has been planned. It's premeditated. Uh, and what has happened is, as a result of the deaths which occurred on the night of 15 June, the entire architecture which was built up by both the governments through a series of agreements from 1993 to 2013, that entire architecture which aimed at maintaining peace on the border, because both sides knew that it was a frontier which had not been delineated or demarcated, uh, all that architecture has now fallen by the wayside. And I'm afraid that the blame, if you want to call it that, for, uh, uh, for it is entirely with the Chinese side. Um, the Indian Army has, of course, and the Indian Armed Forces have given a very solid reply on the ground. And that message that we have sent is that we will not tolerate Chinese bullying and Chinese hegemony. We will not accept that. And I'm afraid that we will have to reiterate and repeat that message through policy dis uh, decisions of the kind that we have just made about banning 59 Chinese apps. And I have been pressing for a ban on Chinese companies from participating in India's 5G hmm. trials as well as rollout. That makes the two of us. Uh, Gautam Bambable, uh, since you mentioned the word bully, which is often associated with the Chinese and the Chinese leadership, I want to know uh, what is it like to deal with Xi Jinping? Is he warm and receptive? Is he cold and distant? How difficult is it to negotiate with him and his team? And I ask this because Chinese diplomacy has come to be dominated by an entire new breed of diplomats, so-called wolf warriors. Does this flow from the top? Uh. Look, I, I can't answer the question about Xi Jinping. I only presented my credentials to him. I don't really know him at all. Uh, but the point you make is not wrong. You know, as a result and as a reaction to the uh, COVID situation across the world, uh, the Chinese have come out diplomatically swinging in all directions, what they describe as wolf warrior diplomacy. This is something that we have not seen from Chinese diplomacy in the past. 
Uh, it is perhaps because of the new circumstances where China is the second largest economy in the world. But I don't think this wolf warrior diplomacy is doing them any good, is doing uh, China any good. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I keep wondering why uh, they are moving in this direction, being so uh, aggressive and flailing out almost in all directions. Bruno Masais, does Xi Jinping have any real allies anymore? And I'm not sure Pakistan and Nepal count very much. Uh, also, does it matter uh, when, when the global order is so fractured and alliances are built on shifting sands and it's, it's more transactional than, than alliance, really? Yeah, I think that's, that's a bit of the paradox because you have many analysts uh, saying that this is perhaps not in China's interest. Uh, but you don't see China really interested in taking advantage of the problems America is having with some of its allies and trying to move in. Clearly, China doesn't think that's important. Clearly, China doesn't think that world politics is a popularity contest. And it's not uh, very worried that its popularity is going down. Uh, it's about hard power. Uh, and it's about economic power. It's about the way you become uh, almost invulnerable because others are dependent on you. And we've seen that dynamic play in many parts of the world. Uh, you know, I would call your attention to German-Chinese relations, uh, where if you look only at soft power variables, if you look at the human rights question, which is important in German politics, you would think that Germany and China would be at the point of, of, of breaking relations. But that's not happening at all. And Chancellor Merkel is still uh, publicly insisting that uh, China is important uh, for the future of, uh, of, of the German economy uh, and no breakup is, is really envisioned. Why? Well, because uh, Chinese companies are already highly dependent on, uh, German companies are already highly dependent on the Chinese market. Uh, and so it becomes difficult to take decisions against Chinese interests. I think this is what China is counting on. Uh, and it's also why China is worried about India, because India does have the capacity to become a serious economic competitor. I, my theory is that uh, what, what we saw happening in Galwan has a lot to do with movements which you saw in India about trying to take advantage of China's problems with the trade war and with COVID to perhaps attract uh, some of the industrial change to India. This was, uh, as you can imagine, badly received in China. It was seen as a serious threat uh, to China's plans, um, and I think uh, Galwan was was a way to react to that. So the game is 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 not limited to the border. Uh, it's a much larger uh, and, in a way, uh, an economic game that is being played. And Xi Jinping uses the military to conduct his foreign policy. Derek Grossman, China is an authoritarian state, and Xi Jinping brings an extraordinary level of personal political power to China's one-party system. How dangerous does this make China for the world? Well, I mean, I yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, authoritarian. I mean, if you look at if you look at the international relations, you know, theory literature. I mean, authoritarian uh, uh, regimes tend to go to war more often. I mean, you know, there's there's always the talk about how democracies never fight each other, right, or almost never fight each other. I think a lot of wars, unfortunately, are started by authoritarian governments. You know, but that said. China also has a lot of other concerns on its plate that it has to deal with. I mean, for example, China is bordered by 17 different countries, um, and it has to keep an eye on all 17 countries, right? And the United States is not even one of those border countries. Uh, of course, India is one, right? Um, in, uh, China now has a, a, a pretty severe economic downturn that it's going to have to address because of this coronavirus crisis. And so as those numbers continue to go down or stay the same, I mean, that's that expectations will not be met. And so we'll see if there's a domestic clamoring for some kind of change at the top. We also have to consider that China spends approximately a third of its budget, one third of its budget, on domestic security issues to police its own population. So when you have all of these other factors in play and you and you can and, and Xi Jinping talks about by 2050 China is going to be a world power it it kind of def, it kind of stretches uh, credulity a bit. Um, so I think we have to keep in mind the context here that China just like the United States just like India just like any other country is juggling many many different balls in the air at the same time. They have ambitions, they're spending more on defense than they ever have, but they also have limitations that they have to consider.
Right. Uh, Gautam Bambavle, Xi Jinping has amassed immense power. He has led purges, both political and against uh, people in the army. Is there no opposition whatsoever that he faces at home? And what have you observed in the years that you were in, in Beijing? Well, I, I, I think he has uh, taken control of most of the levers of power and he has got his people into positions of power. He has tried to, um, you know, he has moved away uh, one way or the other, any opposition to him, either in the party or, or in the army, uh, the armed forces, the PLA in general. Um, but I think what is more important, Palki, is that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has always had this problem of legitimacy. And it seeks legitimacy from the people of China. The current, uh, uh, the current uh, contract, the social contract, as most people know and most people argue, is that the party will deliver uh, ever improving standards of living to the people, which it has for the last 40 years. Uh, if there are economic problems, as some of the other speakers have been indicating, uh, then, of course, there's a turn to uh, the nationalism card, uh, which is, again, a very important card to be played domestically by the Chinese party and by the leader of the Chinese party uh, in order to gain legitimacy from the people of China. So I, I wonder, uh, you know, whether there is a serious economic strain in China itself domestically, which is leading uh, the party and the leader of the party to play this nationalism card through um, military action across uh, uh, the borders of China. I will come to nationalism in a bit. Uh, Bruno Masais, Xi Jinping is called the chairman of all things in China. Is he really invincible according to you? And how do the people of China see him? Because it's very hard to independently verify. You have to go largely by the Chinese press and they're there to cheer rather than report. Well, I, I lived in China last year um, for, for, for 12 months. Um, my, my impression talking to many kinds of people, students, academics, uh, businessmen, particularly in the tech sector, is that uh, well, the legitimacy of the party is strong. You know, people outside China may not like to hear this, particularly in the United States. Uh, but most people seem to think that the party is delivering on, on the things that they care about. Uh, economic opportunity, safety, uh, fighting COVID uh, after the, the initial problems. Uh, so there is a sense that the party is delivering. The party is present everywhere. Um, I didn't see uh, any elements of what you could call the sort of the, the, the last decades of the Soviet regime where the party was so separate from the people and had no idea what was going on. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has 90 million members. They are distributed all over the territory. Uh, there's a story and a tradition of going out into the small villages uh, at the beginning of your career. Uh, that being said, you also hear criticisms, uh, although sometimes those criticisms actually come from the right, let us say, not from the liberal left, but from a more nationalistic, more authoritarian right that thinks that Xi Jinping is being too soft on America, for example. So you do hear, you hear criticisms, you know, at dinner, a quiet dinner, it is possible to hear that, uh, but, uh, but, but it seems... Uh, that Xi Jinping has actually been able to uh, uh, extend uh, his network all over the party, all over Chinese society, and, and those that oppose him uh, are uh, more or less powerless at this point. Derek Grossman, how much damage has the pandemic done to Xi Jinping's position in China? And when I say the pandemic, I also mean the fallouts, including the economic fallout. Yeah, that's that's a really difficult question to answer, uh, and I think you can find evidence to support, you know, that he's going down the tubes or that he's actually uh, emboldened and empowered by this. Uh, I think the economic numbers, the GDP, you know, last quarter was um, w w was was pretty disappointing for China, but um, but then again, I mean. If China is way way ahead of the rest of the world in terms of the curve, right? Uh, the coronavirus flattening the coronavirus curve, or and we if don't they know can the try fingers. to, we don't. Yeah, we don't know, right? We don't know what we don't know. But if I'm saying if they are, and they're already, you know, out of their first wave, and maybe can even avoid a second wave, then China is going to come out looking very, very good in all this. And you know, obviously, Xi Jinping is setting China up to be. The, the one helping everyone in the world get over coronavirus, even though it came from China. And that could include China coming up with a coronavirus vaccine before the end of this year. That's what they've been saying is going to happen, right? So, you know, there's that side of it, right? But then, of course, the negative side is 
Um, if, if China enters a second wave, right, things are even worse than before. Economic indicators continue to go down. The relationship with the U.S. continues to, to unravel. Um, you know, the relationship with India continues to unravel. You know, these China, and you mentioned earlier, China really has no friends. They have Pakistan. Maybe they have they have Cambodia, I guess. Right. Do they have North Korea? Maybe sort of kind of. Right. So, I mean, are those is that really becoming of a, a, a new superpower in the world? I mean, it it kind of it doesn't seem right. Uh, and so Xi Jinping may have to answer those kinds of questions. But also, as Bruno said, I mean, the Communist Party has, you know, 90 million members. They tend to co-opt the very wealthy to become Communist Party members. Uh, and so that uh, gives them some skin in the game, some skin in the system to keep the system uh, humming along. And so I don't see China becoming, you know, not communist uh, anytime soon. Uh, but they may decide to get rid of Xi Jinping if everything goes in the wrong direction. But it's really difficult to tell, unfortunately. Gautam Bambavli, you spoke about nationalism. Xi Jinping has been talking about rejuvenation since the day he entered office, his own brand of nationalism. He's co-opted Confucius. Uh, how much of this is positioning? And, and do the Chinese people really care about all of this uh, when they, I believe, would much rather move forward than dwell on the past and focus on what they're earning? No, I, I think it's an important issue in China, as it is in many countries across the world, most countries across the world. Uh, but the thing is that, uh, you know, the turn to uh, towards playing this nationalism card in order to win support from the people, uh, this is something which happens when the economics of the situation are not going right. Um, and uh, I, I'm not saying I really don't know what's happening with the economic situation within China right now, especially in a post-COVID China. Uh, but if the economic situation is uh, not as hunky-dory as is being made out to be, uh, then, of course, there will be uh, a need to play the nationalism card, which includes being muscular and aggressive in the South China Sea, possibly the East China Sea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and on the India-China border. Bruno Masai, uh, Xi Jinping calls himself the son of the Yellow Earth. Uh, he's also a party princeling. He's tried to find a way to... Uh, to, to reach out to both the sections of society in that sense. He's a crusader against corruption, he says, but he's also the usurper of power. How do you decode this man and this leader? Well, there's one thing unifying all factions and, and, and actually giving purpose to Xi Jinping himself, which is uh, really to, to eventually to equal the United States in power and in the second half of this century uh, to replace the United States. Uh, I was amused to see a recent speech by a, a foreign minister uh, uh, Wang Yi, uh, about how uh, China has no intention whatsoever to displace the United States, and you know, having and anyone who has lived in China knows that this is a goal that cuts across society, uh, that cu cuts across the leadership. So I think this gives purpose to uh, uh, to the leadership and gives purpose to Chinese foreign policy. Uh, then it is true there are there are different sensibilities, uh, and when we see, for example, over the past uh, four or five months, China becoming much more aggressive, you already saw that in China. It was part of of, of the Chinese Communist Party and part of Chinese society, and perhaps what that means is that Xi Jinping eventually decided that that sector of the party and that sector of society was now more powerful than than other sectors. He himself was always inclined to think along those terms. He was always inclined to think that China would have one opportunity uh, to affirm its power and had to grab that opportunity, uh, that these things would not come naturally. Perhaps the uh, leadership in the past, both Mao and then, believed in loss of history, and you just had to wait, and naturally uh, you would come out on top. Uh, Xi Jinping is much more of a Leninist in that sense, more of a Leninist than a Marxist. He thinks that you have to grab the opportunity when it comes. And it's possible that, that he thinks this is the opportunity. It is possible that he thinks that COVID and, and, and the American election is really the opportunity where China can change the rules of the game, which is something they've been trying to do for a long time. They think that the rules need to be changed. Do you think he also overplayed his hand with the Belt and Road? 
Uh, no, I don't. I think the Belt and Road so far has worked pretty well for China. Uh, it's moved faster than, uh, than, than they thought. And with the exception of India, they've, uh, they've managed to acquire a level of influence that they didn't have before. Part of it because of the, sort of the hopes and expectations that Belt and Road creates that lots of money is going to be available. It is true that China doesn't have allies, but when China needs to have a statement signed by a number of countries on Xinjiang or on Hong Kong, they can get 60 countries to sign a statement. Sometimes the statements that you, you read the statement and you wonder how anyone could have signed it. And it's not because they are treaty allies uh, or very uh, friendly countries, but it's because it's countries that are already so integrated economically with China that uh, the Chinese ambassador in those countries has no trouble getting the government to sign pretty much anything. Derek Grossman, a U.S. Embassy telegram in 2009 said this about Xi Jinping. Uh, it said that he is not corrupt, but he's been, uh, and he's not interested in money, but you could say that he's been corrupted by power. Do you agree with this assessment? A longtime uh, colleague of mine, I won't say who, but who's extremely knowledgeable on um, Chinese politics, said in China, you cannot rise to the position of the leader of China, the, the head of the, uh, the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, without being corrupt. Uh, it, is, it is an impossibility, because in order to um, create the environment that would get you into that position, you need to have friends in high places. You need to have what they would consider to be guanxi, which is, you know, just connections, networking, but in fact, it, a lot of times is payoffs. Uh, and quid pro quos. Um, and so, yeah, the notion that Xi Jinping is not corrupt, I think, is patently false. That's an interesting insight. Corruption is a prerequisite to rise in the Chinese system. Gautam Bambavle, I would like to end uh, with the question I began with. How do you deal with Xi Jinping's China? Uh, the talk of boycott is all very well, but we all know that China is not dispensable, not dispensable just yet. So what kind of alliances then should India work on or perhaps even lead? Um, I, I think I'll begin uh, to answer that question, especially for the Indian audience, because uh, I think we have to understand that India's approach to the world, uh, which is summarized by the Sanskrit words Vasudeva Kutumbakam, meaning the world is one family, is something which the Chinese don't subscribe to. The Chinese look at themselves at the center of the world and they are very selfish and they are looking at their own national self-interest and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. So I think for an Indian audience, you know, we should begin with this big difference between the way India approaches the world and, the, and China approaches the world. Um, but to come back to your question, I, I would say that, um, you know, India is now, I believe, on the path where it will have to strengthen its partnerships with democracies across the world, including the United States, of course, uh, but also Japan, Australia, um, perhaps countries like Indonesia, South Korea, uh, and we will have to do this uh, relatively quickly. Uh, as I said earlier, that uh, what has happened on the ground uh, militarily in, in uh, the India-China border areas this summer has pushed India definitely strategically into the arms of the United States. And we need to strengthen that partnership. There's no doubt about that where I am concerned. Bruno Masai, uh, is there global political will to put China in its place? Hong Kong, I would say, is as good as gone. The Uyghur issue has been around for years, but it's only now that sanctions are being imposed. Uh, the call for a probe is more symbolic than substantial. Are leaders of the world really ready to take on China, or are they just going through the motions in dealing with China? No, I think, I think they are. Uh, more and more people are worried about, uh, about Chinese power. Um, we all know that China is going to become a very powerful country. We know that China is going to be one of the world's uh, two superpowers, but still that has to be managed, uh, and particularly when China becomes expansionist uh, or even sort of spiraling into a kind of imperialistic uh, dynamic, uh, then countries have to get together and, and, and see how this can be managed. For the time being, I think the critical question is really the economic question. I go back to that. That's where you find a consensus all over the world uh, that uh, China's economic rise is creating problems for everyone. When you go into questions like Xinjiang, Hong Kong, or questions of security, then there are disagreements. Uh, 
India, I think, has some of the best thinkers of, on, on China uh, uh, today. So I always uh, have a certain trepidation in, in giving advice. But I wrote a, a recent piece in the Times of India arguing that the economic question is really the critical question. And the, the best way for India to respond to, 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 to the problem that China is causing is to become a $5 trillion economy and to really move into these areas of high technology. Uh, that's actually where you see China worried about India. And so that's, that's um, I think, critical. Uh, now, the important thing, I'll conclude with that when dealing with China, is that you never find yourself in a position of dependence. Uh, then you never find yourself in a position of vulnerability. And if you're not in that position, it's, uh, it's, it's possible to talk to China and to, and to reach a, a solution that uh, both sides can agree on. If you find yourself in a position of dependence, then, then you suffer. Uh, and some countries have been successfully doing this and others have not. Uh, some countries that sign a BRI memorandum have been successful doing this. Uh, Malaysia is a good example. Uh, and other countries that are outside BRI have not been successful in reducing their dependence ties. Uh, I, I mentioned Germany, and I think it's, it's still a good example. So focus on having a balanced economic relation with China, where you also have leverage, where you also have power. And then I think things will go much better. Derek Grossman, Xi Jinping is an avid player of the board game Go, and some say that it shows in his foreign policy too. How do you deal with his China? I think that analogy has been used quite a bit, uh, and it's probably true. I mean, it, China definitely has a, a long-term vision, which is unfortunately severely lacking in the United States. Uh, and that long-term vision of where it sees itself uh, and how it's going to get there is multifaceted. I mean, you can take a look at, you know, any time there is a, um, a party congress, you know, they release lots of documents um, that explain, you know, five-year plans, like wh where China's going to be and how it's going to get there specifically. And it, they break it down into every different sector, too. I mean, agriculturally, techn technologically, uh, you know, and the list goes on and on, right? So, so I think that it's not necessarily so much um, a game of go, because uh, that, that makes it seem like there's some kind of secret motives involved. I mean, I think the motive is clear, that China wants to become on par with the United States, if not surpass the United States, as other uh, panelists have, have said. Um, but, but I think it's more about they have a strategy, they're sticking to the strategy, and that makes them, I think, that puts them in a, in a better position, at least vis-a-vis -vis the United States, in my opinion, because in the United States, we're very much, you know, kind of chasing the ball one issue after another, and coronavirus is just the latest uh, version of that. We're trying to get our act together on China. There's now a bipartisan consensus in Congress to compete with and counter China at every turn. There's an Indo-Pacific uh, strategy report that talks about how China's a rival and an adversary, and we need to compete and counter China at every turn. But, I mean, we have to put all of that into practice. China's already been putting their plans into practice, so that's what it, that's what I worry about longer term. Yes, some reports that the U.S. president may have sought Chinese help for re-election. So it's an interesting uh, time to, to be tracking China. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. When Xi Jinping came to power, many said that he might be the Chinese Gorbachev, a man of reform, who they hoped would reform the system without destroying it. But he turned out to be the Chinese Putin, a president for life. And now he's left all of them behind in his quest for world domination. Can the world find a way to deal with Xi Jinping with minimum collateral damage? As they say, only time will tell. Marie Curie had once said, nothing in life is to be feared, only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. Well, that was our aim and mission with this edition of the We On Global Summit. We believe the key to tackling the threat from the Middle Kingdom is to understanding it first. The Wuhan virus pandemic is one of the most defining moments for mankind. The actions that world leaders take today will define the destinies of their countries and the world. The same is true for an assertive and jingoistic China. The recent actions of the Communist Party pose a challenge to the world order. It is set to change after the pandemic. And we have to see how. There will be new rules that will dictate national security economic priorities, the use of technology, diplomacy, and it would be premature to suggest what the post-pandemic world will look like. But it won't be wrong to say that the question of China would be at the heart of the new rules of engagement. Thank you for watching.